você com a sua música esqueceu o principal Que no peito dos desafinados, no fundo do peito bate calado No peito dos desafinados também bate um coração All right, good afternoon everyone Welcome to the Summer Launch Incubator Showcase for Georgetown Entrepreneurship. My name is Jeff Reed. I'm the founding director of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative. And uh, we're excited to uh, highlight a lot of our student entrepreneurs here today. So this, uh, we start with the belief at Georgetown Entrepreneurship that, that entrepreneurship is one of the world's most powerful forces for positive social change. And as everyone in the world has experienced disruption over the last year, we've also seen entrepreneurs finding opportunities, solving problems, and, uh, and, and creating a future that we can all be excited about. This particular program is in its 11th year. Uh, the Summer Launch Incubator helps particularly those students who want to start a business, but, uh, but maybe during the school year, they have other distractions like classes, for instance. Uh, we've given them some intensive coaching and a chance to really, really uh, work on their startups over the last several weeks. So we're excited here for the 11th year in a row to have our summer launch incubator. Uh, before we go too much further, I want to give a big shout out to one of our advisory group members uh, and an entrepreneur in residence and mentor in this program, Neil Primkumar, the founder of Dyla Brands. I've got one of his great products here, the Forto coffee shots, uh, but Neil has made this particular program possible this year uh, with a generous gift. So we thank you, Neil, for making this, uh, this whole program possible. And next I get to introduce uh, an amazing leader, the co-director of this year's summer launch, uh, someone who has been an incredibly valuable entrepreneur and residence and mentor for us here at Georgetown for several years. This year, she stepped up and took a leadership role with summer launch. Uh, she has also uh, started a new job not too long ago as entrepreneurial specialist for the Good Food Institute. With that, I'm here to I'm happy to turn over to our co-director of Summer Launch, Laura Clark. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, everybody. It has been such a privilege to help guide the 12 amazing teams who participated in this year's program. They've all been hard at work for the past month, validating and invalidating assumptions and having critical conversations with potential customers to determine product market fit. This year's showcase is an opportunity for them to present their ventures and highlight the progress and findings that came out of the incubator. Before we get today officially underway, I want to extend my sincere appreciation for the formidable team who made summer launch possible, many of whom under Jeff Reed's leadership run the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, making it the innovative, thriving and transformative program that it is. This team includes my superhero summer launch co-director, Ben Zimmerman, who is managing director of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, the indispensable David Lang, program manager of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, and Shania Wright, intern extraordinaire. I also want to thank the esteemed group of mentors who have given so generously of their time and guidance and the many guest speakers who shared their expertise. We'll have a chance to highlight them shortly, but first, it is a tremendous honor to be able to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mr. Raul Fernandez. Mr. Fernandez is currently vice chairman and owner of Monumental Sports and Entertainment, a private partnership that owns the Washington Mystics, the Washington Capitals, the Washington Wizards, and Wizards District Gaming NBA 2K. The partnership also owns and operates DC's premier sports and entertainment complex, Capital One Arena. Mr. Fernandez is a senior advisor and limited partner to General Atlantic Partners, a growth equity firm with more than $50 billion under management. Well known in the tech industry and the Washington DC area as the founder of Proxicom and the chairman and CEO of Object Video. Mr. Fernandez also previously served as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He is an active technology investor in disruptive companies. He served on the board of directors of Liz Claiborne and Kate Spade and Company for 16 years. He now serves on the boards of Capital Investment Corp 5, DXC Technology, Broadcom, GameStop, GameStop Urbaneer, Insight, and Perfect Sense. A dedicated philanthropist, Mr. Fernandez focuses his energy on educational reform in the DC region. 
He co-founded Venture Philanthropy Partners and is a board member of the DC College Access Program and the Fernandez Foundation. A native Washingtonian, he holds a degree in economics from the University of Maryland. He has been profiled by the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Forbes, CNBC, The Industry Standard, The Washington Post, and CNN. On a personal note, I had the distinct honor of working with Raul at Proxicom, where he artfully navigated a highly competitive landscape while never losing sight of the people who worked with him. He is responsible for what has become my lifelong love of entrepreneurship. Please welcome Mr. Raul Fernandez. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. That was so great and really appreciate the introduction. And um, thinking back to our time together, it, it reminds me of like what, what it felt like to, to have you know fields that were completely new to, to be able to invent, make up stuff because everything was new. And I think one of the cool things that I'm looking forward to hearing from the 12 teams and the entrepreneurs uh, and the advisors is how you're taking advantage of essentially a brand new landscape. Uh, what we've been through is a once in a century, uh, hopefully once in a century uh, experience, but it has fundamentally accelerated a whole bunch of industries. Um, it has shifted in, in massive amounts, um, a ton of spending. Um, you know, we could talk about education, ed tech, we could talk about collaboration tools, we could talk about gaming consumption, we could talk about a whole bunch of industries that, that have been accelerated uh, in a very meaningful way. Um, and also new ways of doing business. And, and one of the coolest things, and Laura, you, you remember this from our time, it, literally at the beginning of secure transactions and, and the internet, and um, was that when something is brand new, there are no incumbents that can say, I've been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years. And it really does level the playing field for startups, for people that can get it very quickly, that can put together a business plan, that can execute against that business plan, that can make money and grow. Um, and all of a sudden, some company that is one year, two years old, can 100% compete with companies that have been around for decades um, that, and that are also much bigger. And I think we're in one of those moments right now. It's, it's a combination of acceleration of digital across a lot of key industries. It's also a combination of changing the way we do business. If you think about what we were doing a year and a half ago versus what we're doing now uh, and what we will be doing as the world reopens, well, th there's going to be fundamentally less business travel. I mean, I, I think back on some of the trips that I used to take, you know, to very far away places like China and Japan, and probably half of those going forward won't happen. Um, oh. They'll be plus. Yes. Can you Sorry hear me? To interrupt. I want to ask if, uh, if, if there's something you can do on your, on your camera. All we can see is a table here. Oh. I don't know if you... Okay. We saw you for a second there. There we go. All right. Thanks. Are you, and, are uh, you good? David, maybe, maybe you can take down the slide so we can spotlight uh, our speaker too. Thanks, Raul. Back to you. Are, are you, uh, are we, because I can't see myself on the, on the view that I can't pull up my own view here. Yeah, we can see you. There's a, there's a right, bright, sir, bright right. sun behind you, but that's great. Awesome. Thanks. Um, all right. So listen, let me, uh, yeah, that's better here. Let me just adjust this. Is that better? All right. That's great, that's that's okay. Perfect. Perfect. Hi, all right. Well, that helps when I can see myself. Um, so as I was saying, this is one of those times where the, the playing field is leveled, where you literally have new business models that are coming into place, but, but you do have to remember, you know, fundamentals. And, and I, as you guys are pitching your businesses, you know, there are some things that, that, you know, don't change regardless of, uh, of, of what time period we're talking about or what technology. And, and that is, you know, do you have the right product or service is the cost of that product or service, um, you know, set at the right price, given the revenue that you're bringing in per unit, whether that unit is an hour, whether that unit is a minute of consumption, whether that unit is a transaction where you're making a margin on, there are fundamentals across all these businesses of gross margin, net margin, cost of goods sold. And you've got to keep that in mind because I think all of us can fall in love with things that you know, we create, that we invent. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to you to gut check yourself. It's up to your partners, your advisors, your investors to make you look at the math and say, okay, I get it now, we may not be making money, but there is a point in time where this thing accelerates and it actually turns into something that um, is sustainable. 
And, you know, I was fortunate in, in a way, in a weird way that I started my company when there was almost no venture capital, there was no ecosystem like the great ecosystem that you've got here in Georgetown. There was no network of advisors. So literally to start the company had to save enough money to get it going and had to invest every money, every dollar that we made. Um, and we had to make money from day one because there was no option of, of running a, a negative cash flow. We had to reinvest every money that we made back into the business to continue to grow. And finally, then we got access to venture capital. We got access to growth capital. We were able to spend ahead of the, the, the money that we were making and collecting. And that's how we were able to scale the business from essentially four, four engineers to 2,500 people globally, public company. Um, and it was a great, great dream come true. Um, but, it, but it does, again, require you to have you know, some, some grounding in, in the fundamentals and in the long term how the business ultimately grows and how the business ultimately becomes sustainable. Um, I'm involved in a lot of businesses, as you heard, a, a really big chip company in Broadcom, um, a uh, services company in DXC, and probably the most interesting one that I've been involved in for two years up until two weeks ago was GameStop. And, um, and that was a, a fascinating uh, company. It was a turnaround. It was one where we had uh, worked with an investor that was coming in that was going to help accelerate digitization and it was going to bring in help bring in new management and all of a sudden you know a very democratically fueled eruption happened around us and um we got swept up in these in these headlines and you know it, i got a lot of stories and we can do a whole separate session on that so i, I won't go into a lot of that but I'll, I'll save some time for questions and we'll cover any any areas um but whether it's companies that have benefited and a lot of our companies have benefited uh, with COVID because people have spent more on digital, they have spent more on products that bring um, services to market, other products to market. In our sports business, you know, we, we've all taken a hit. Obviously, we haven't had people, fans in the building. We've had, uh, when we had a shortened season last season, our viewership went down. Um, we've had teams that have been affected by COVID, you know, throughout now two seasons. We've had to shorten our season. We had to change our playoff, you know, and all of that has impacted and, and the two leagues I know best are the NBA and the NHL in a significant way. And it's impacted the owners. It's an impacted the employees that work in the building. It's an impacted all the executives that work in, in the industry. And it's impacted uh, the players um, because, uh, you know, one thing that, um, that in both leagues, we have a, a revenue sharing. So as revenues went up, salaries went up, and that sharing went up, well, it also works in reverse. So as revenues went down, salaries went down, and um, that's all created what I, what, I, what I refer to as a two-year pothole, right? So we've had two seasons, two years roughly, where we've, we've had this you know, big decrease in people coming in, we've had a big decrease in revenue. And now as we enter the new season, which will be after the playoffs are done, uh, in October, November of this year, we can finally reset ourselves and we can finally hopefully get back to the year that, that we had going into COVID. So from a, from a league standpoint and from a business standpoint, if we can in the first full cycle back, just get back to where we were at when COVID hit us, it would be a huge success. Having said that, we probably have a couple hundred million in extra debt <laughs> that we weren't planning on. And none of that was, was debt that was geared towards innovation, invention. Now we are forced to innovate in a lot of ways in terms of taking our game directly to the, to the fan in a different way and having different angles and changing you know, how we ticket. But now I think as you go back to arenas, whether you're going back to a concert, to a game, you'll see it be uh, much more digital holistically. So ticketless, uh, all digital, very little cash, um, in some arenas, there won't be any cash, you know, being being exchanged at all. So again, if, if you would have predicted that 36 months ago, we would have all said you're crazy. There's no way that you cannot use cash in an arena. And now I bet you as we open up fully, half the arenas won't accept cash. So this that's a really easy example to show you how quickly things have transformed um, and and people are catching up uh, with that with that transformation. Um, as I think back, and, and I want to leave some time for questions, and I'd love to take anything that you guys had, and, and I'm more excited to, to actually hear and, and see your presentations. 
when I think back on my time in growing a company, when I think back on the public companies that I've been on, the public companies that I'm on today, um, and, and I think about what are the ingredients for success, I, I think it all starts with people. It's all about human capital, human talent, and teams. And it's about people that complement each other. You know, I, I like teams that, that have people that have different strengths, different point of views, that can push each other, that can collaborate, um, and, and frankly, you know, that, that have areas of expertise that are deeper. So when I work with a company, I know I have some areas of expertise where I've got a lot of experience. I've seen a lot of ups and downs and, and others around the table have other areas of expertise and I learn from that, I enjoy it. Um, and those types of teams to me are very complimentary. Um, and again, that gets down to um, d diversity in thought, diversity across the board in terms of the types of people that are around the table, the men and women and their backgrounds that are around the table. And, um, and then a very healthy, both um, respect for everybody's opinion who's there, and then also an ability to challenge each other. I think all those are kind of keys to building great teams and great teams build great companies. Um, so I, let me turn it over, uh, Laura, to you. Um, if you wanna ask the first question or we can open it up to the team. I'm happy to cover anything. Um, but, um, I, I, I would be happy to ask the first question. Sure. I, I'd love for you to kind of share how you, how you became an entrepreneur. Uh, was it from early early childhood something that was in your blood, or is it something that you stumbled upon later? What was the journey? Yeah, you know, I I um, I was working actually in a tech company in an emerging technologies you know division at the time. And again, this was you know uh, pre pre internet, and uh, it was client server kind of architecture and C plus plus programming, and and I had a small team, and it was a great little company, and I had a great little team and and I, I got it got to the point where my little team was was growing and they said hey um we we want to bring somebody else that's experienced in because clearly this is growing and and while you've learned it and done it organically we think somebody else should come in so to me to, for me it was great because I felt like slighted by by that because I thought well I, I'm building this just give me the chance to continue to build it they didn't they brought somebody in I I then left I took part of my team, I took part of the client base, and then started my own company. So it was something I always wanted to do. But at that moment in time, you know, I'd finished college, I didn't have much debt. I, I, I completely was aware that if I failed and crashed and burned, I had enough time <laughs> to like recover and, 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 you know, go into another career or find something different. So from a risk and personal life standpoint, it was a great moment in time. And then I got kind of you know, pushed along because I, I got, you know, looked over uh, for a spot. And that was the extra little, you know, little, little click that I needed to, uh, to get going. But what's cool is I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's so much more in our culture today than it was then to step out, to have an idea, to try an idea. And I think one of the greatest things about our culture here is that um, it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. And I, you know, my best learnings have been around failures. I have learned more from failing than I have from being successful. And I've been, I've failed many more times than I've been successful. So, and I continue to do that. So it, it's, it's a great, and, and part of that is the culture we live in, right? It's, it's accepted. People can get a second act, a third act. You can start something else. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that makes this, this ecosystem we live in super unique. Thank you. I, I agree with that. I think especially about failure, although I haven't seen you fail a lot, but I'll, I'll trust <laughs> if you say so. Uh, you I talk to one of my kids any minute, they'll, they'll point out <laughs> some, some stuff, you know. So, <laughs> so um, I would like to turn it over for questions and hope that nobody feels shy because I'm sure there are some questions out there. So um, I would love to see somebody raise their hand. If not, I'm going to pick on one of you in particular. So look for <laughs> This is Ben. Laura, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A feature. Uh, and then we had uh, Shauna, one of our representatives, to go after that. The question in the in the box here says, what can students be doing, Raul, today to develop those critical teamwork skills you spoke about? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I do think when I, when I think about it, and I've got kids, you know, uh, from, from 19, 15, and 13. And I think one of the things that, that I've encouraged that helped me 
was, you know, to be very engaged again with, with people of, of diverse backgrounds um, in, 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 you know, multiple settings. I think sports is a great way of learning how to be a teammate. And, and uh, you know, I, um, I, I meet a lot of people that, that obviously have a dream to, to, to get into professional sports. And, you know, I, I tell them, listen, there, for most of those kids, unfortunately, there's a better chance that they will go invent a new technology than become a billionaire and be able to buy a basketball team rather than actually play on that basketball team <laughs> because the math for the humans that actually play on that basketball team are, are very, very low. So it's not about getting into sports to try to be the champion or to try to play pro. It's about learning what it's like to be dependent, dependent on uh, what it's like to have um, a, you know, responsibility. Um, and I think, I think sports is one of the best ways. And I think engagement where, where there's engagement in any kind, right? So whether that's a club or whether that's some sort of, 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 of school or, or non-school activity where you're forced out of your, your kind of comfort zone and you're forced to you know, do something or build something together. I think all of those experiences and, and, and that can be in a collaborative art project, that can be in a collaborative anything project um, but sports is one that, you know, again, it can be a, an adult league uh, on anything. It, it, it's one that I think is, is just brings it home um, to everybody and, and, uh, and helps. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and obviously these, these types of programs are fantastic. So this, this is terrific. Shana, did you have a question? Yes, um, thank you so much for being here, Joel. This is so inspiring. Um, can you share with us a moment of failure and what silver lining you found or lesson you learned that was helpful? Um, sure. I, I, as I think back in in business, um, you know, there are many times where, and and you know, when you're in the moment and you have a major failure, and I, I can think of of one, it was pre-public, we had a very big customer and we really just messed it up. Like we completely messed up, you know, what we were supposed to deliver. It didn't work. We were, we, we signed up for a project that, you know, in retrospect, we were never ever gonna be able to make on time. But, you know, we were inexperienced, we were eager, we were hungry. And um, I remember thinking, oh my God, this is gonna affect us. We're not gonna be able to go public. We're gonna get sued by this customer. We're going to have, you know, a ton of issues. We're going to lose staff. We're obviously going to lose this contract. And, and, and you, you get that like pit in your stomach and then you go deal with it. You could know, go, go confront it and it ended up being okay. We ended up saying, Hey, you know, obviously we're not, we, we need to finish this. We need to get it right. Give us another chance. I know it's cost some money, but let us figure out a way. And, and it's funny because in that particular story, the client that, that we didn't do a good job on and, it turned out to we we they invested in our company pre-public and we went public and our stock went up and so they ended up making a lot more money you know investing in us because they believed them in us than um than the amount of money that they spent on the project so that's just one example you know in, in my company where i was like oh my god this is really going to completely derail everything that we had planned for the next you know two years um, and it ended up working, but I think the, the, the lesson to learn there, whether it's big or small is to engage is just, just to, just to get in there and, and engage. Thanks Raul. Anybody else want to venture forth with a question? Ben, you can probably see better than I can. Yeah. Um, we, we have a bunch of questions in the queue here. Um, oh. Raul, uh, so. First one says, what are the differences between men's sports teams and a woman's sports team? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> you can yeah, answer no, that so, one. <laughs> so, so that, that, that's a great question. Listen, yeah. I think at the end of the day, everybody's a competitor. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, being involved, obviously, in the WNBA, being involved in the NBA, being involved in the NHL, being involved in an NBA 2K team. I mean, we, we have a team that is a video game, you know, playing team right. and they won a championship last year. I, I, I think um, they're all competitors. They're all wanting to win. I, I, you know, one of the things that disappointed me the most and during COVID was 
our WNBA team, the Mystics won and they had to leave right after that championship because they were, most of them were playing in China and Europe uh, right after our season was done because they actually frankly make more money in, in those, in those venues. And so we couldn't throw a parade for them. And so the parade was scheduled for the April, the April right after the March of, of the beginning of COVID. So we never got to appropriately celebrate uh, the incredible women that won that championship. And, and we will at some point now that the city is open back up, but the, the, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, anybody that, that competes at that level, they're all champions. They've all struggled. They all have inc incredible um, talents. And one of the things that I loved our, 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 our NBA coach brought one of the WNBA players in um, and we built this training center that has everybody. So you could have, a WNBA uh, practice finishing while an NBA practice is starting. And we wanted that sort of cross pollination, but anyway, she's an incredible free throw shooter. And, you know, he, he brought her into the men's practice and, and made a couple of people like really pay attention to her mechanics, you know, and how she did it because she's was one of the best in the world at it. And so being able to share that amongst that level of professionals is really cool. And being able to see that is really cool. That's great. All right, I think we have time probably for one more question here uh, and then we'll wrap up. What do you see as one or two fundamental changes to startups and the ecosystems as a result of COVID and will it be helping generally speaking or hurting uh, you know, those, those industries? Yeah, well, so look, I think one of the things that, that benefits startups um, and, and benefits all companies, but I think startups be, because you've like very quickly adapted and, and you don't have 30, 40 years of, of working in offices side by side together. So, so while there's a lot of good that goes with that, the, the ability to virtually team together, virtually collaborate, develop, bring a product to market with, with teammates that can literally be all over the world. Um, you know, before as, as business owners, we would say, okay, we can hire in our offices and then kind of a circle close to our offices. 50 miles, 100 miles, 150 miles. Well, guess what? Yes, that's still important um, for people that need to come in, you know, once or twice a week. But now we can hire anywhere. And, and frankly, if, if it's better for you to live in Traverse City, Michigan, and the cost of living is better, and the quality of life is better, and the education's better, and you've got a young family and you want to raise them there, it's fine. It's great. And, um, and it works out for everyone. And, and we just change the way we operate. So I think I think entrepreneurial companies and entrepreneurs are better suited to embrace this radical change than a lot of the big companies who are embracing it, but it's a little bit more of an awkward walk. It's like some of those TikTok dances with the older people doing them versus the younger people doing them. Thanks, Raul. All right, well, I, I, I think we're, Ben, I think we're at about a time. Is, is that a wrap? Yeah, I think you want to bring us back home. For me or for Raul? <laughs> Both. All right, Raul, thank you so very, very much. It was wonderful to hear from you. And uh, I know all of the teams and the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Looking forward to, to staying on and watching this. So thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ben. All right. So next we are going to uh, begin the, this uh, event. We're going to see all of the 12 teams pitch. And just so you understand, we are going to have a recording available through our YouTube channel, Georgetown Entrepreneurship uh, YouTube. And then also we'll post on our social media channels. I'd now like to introduce uh, Megan Nguyen, a longtime Georgetown uh, entrepreneurship digital intern, and she will be introducing the pitches and acting as our MC. Thank you so much, Laura, for that warm introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to host a Georgetown entrepreneurship event, especially the summer launch incubator showcase, considering that it's one of my favorite events of the, of the year. Um, before we had this new normal, when we were in person, I was actually able to attend a few of the different workshops of SLI, and it was absolutely incredible to see all the work that students have put into their business ideas. 
And I know that this year's cohort of companies have also worked tirelessly towards their ventures uh, from conducting customer discovery interviews um, to also just connecting with experts in the field as well. And I'm excited to introduce these companies tonight, uh, this afternoon rather, which will be pitching alphabetically based on their company names. And the first company of this afternoon will be Act Worldly. Please enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is Betsy Rowless, and I'm a rising junior at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service, pursuing a major in international politics and a minor in journalism. And for the last year and a half, I have been living through a screen. Unfortunately, most Americans have been doing the same, with the average adult spending 13 or more hours a day looking at some form of electronic screen. And when they look at those screens, what they see is an overwhelming amount of notifications about things such as a rising death toll due to the coronavirus pandemic hate-driven murders of innocent Black Americans, and wildfires ripping through our country due to climate change. After having these notifications in front of me all day, it left me overwhelmed as they were telling me about all these horrible things, but they weren't giving me chances to do anything about it. Google searches left me unsure of how to validate which avenues of helping were the best, and reposting about causes on social media felt like a great first step, but it didn't feel like enough. This constant cycle that I was in left me with all of these questions. How can I help? Why should I care? What should I be doing? Will I even make an impact? And the most important question, where do I start? With this question at the top of my mind, I identified this as a problem, not just for me, but amongst many friends. The problem being a pent up desire of young people who spend their time on screens and want help, but who don't know where to start. I realized there might be a solution to the helplessness that many felt as they watched the world through a screen. I used my background as a journalism student and connections through Georgetown to focus my understanding over the last four weeks of why students got involved or why they didn't, and to understand what social impact organizations struggled with most when it came to getting students involved. I have since completed 25 customer discovery interviews, which I broke into four different segments. Experts in the field of social impact and engagement, earliest users of Georgetown students looking to get involved and stay involved, customers of social impact organizations in the DC area looking for college volunteers, and secondary users of college students not currently looking to get involved. After talking to people in each of these buckets, I learned two main things. The first is that there are a variety of ways that students discover how to get involved in volunteer opportunities or engage with the social cause in other ways but that these ways are largely inefficient and not very comprehensive. The second thing I learned is that social impact organizations often lose volunteers, especially college volunteers, due to scheduling issues and a lack of connection. I initially thought that students would wanna publicize their giving back endeavors. But after my discussions, what I learned is that people are seeking to form human connections and feel good about the work they're doing. The evidence from my interview showed Georgetown students want to get involved, but like me, they need to know where to start in a more efficient and collaborative way. Thus, I've begun to develop an MVP that simply takes into account the current platforms used to discover and learn about ways to get involved and combines it with the current ways to connect with each other and organizations to share in these opportunities. As I thought about the best way Act Worldly can marry these two different segments with my customer interview feedback in mind, I determined the MVP will be similar to a Google Calendar meets volunteer calendar linked through the actworldly.com URL I own. Georgetown students will be able to view a volunteer and other engagement opportunities in the DC area. It will also show what it is specifically you will be doing, what interest or skill set it requires, and who else from Georgetown is volunteering there. With a simple platform like this, we are allowing people to create deeper and more meaningful relationships. But throughout my time in the summer lunch incubator, I have learned to start small and dream big. So as I move forward and test my MVP, I know I have this vision in mind of creating the next social media dedicated to the ways people are getting involved so we can create even more meaningful relationships and meaningful impact, something I am passionate about. Because at Act Worldly, I believe you don't have to be a superhero to be someone's hero. You just have to start somewhere. So today, I'm asking that you start with Act Worldly. Specifically, I am asking for connections to social impact organizations in the DC area looking for college volunteers, 
students interested in the project who have a background in computer science, and students interested in the project who can help organize content for the MVP launch, which, with your help, we can launch by the end of the summer to get Georgetown students involved right when they step back on campus. Today, I am asking that you start by making an impact with Act Worldly. Thank you. Thank you so much for your pitch, Act Worldly. At Georgetown Entrepreneurship, we certainly believe that one of the greatest forces to make possible change um, is through entrepreneurship. We combine Georgetown's Jesuit values with entrepreneurship to develop innovative ideas while helping people. And we're, Act Worldly certainly embodies that. Up next, uh, we have community experiments. Please take it away. Hello, my name is Lauren Jordan, an MBA candidate at the McDonough School of Business, and I'm the founder of Community Experiments. In 2015, a close friend of mine attempted suicide. It wasn't just this attempt that was worrying, it was the way she was subsequently shamed by her family and friends. From there, I began to pay closer attention to the mental health of people around me and realized that despite the fact that mental challenges are everywhere, many people who I know and love are simply not doing enough to take care of their mental health. Adult Black people are more likely to have feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness than adult whites. It is becoming ever more clear that Black people need to access mental health care. However, only one in three Black people who need mental health care receive it. There are many structural issues to reaching that goal, but the first obstacle is overcoming the pervasive stigma against accessing mental health care in the Black community. This stigma exists for many reasons, from the cultural expectation of remaining strong and mental illness being perceived as a weakness, to religiosity and an emphasizing prayer over mental health care, to the criminalization of mental illness, where folks with mental illnesses have been disproportionately institutionalized and incarcerated. However, it is the intergenerational trauma that immeasurably contributes to the stigma. From Henrietta Lacks to the Tuskegee experiments to the Black maternal mortality rate, the medical field has consistently enacted trauma on the Black community to the point that many Black people would rather suffer than go to the doctor. Why should Black people trust institutions that continue to inflict harm? on us. Though there is a distrust in the medical institution, Black people still need care. As the field pushes itself to address its structural inequalities, my intention is to work with communities on the ground by offering alternative entry points towards a holistically healthy life. We must get people to talk about this subject that they would rather not discuss. So how do we do that? My answer, the arts. Community Experiments partners with local adult arts and community organizations, as well as educational institutions to provide creative arts-based mental health solutions for the Black community. Creative activities can relieve stress, aid communication, and create community. Artistic activities allow for people to understand and embody emotions without having to explicitly dive deeply into them. Community Experiments is still in the iterative stage but there have been several business model hypotheses. It started as an incubator where K-12 students would design mental health venture projects for their own communities. It changed into a script doctoring consulting service that targeted black production houses. And now it is in its third iteration as a partnership model for adults. As a cellist, an author, and an improviser, I have seen the power that the arts can have on someone's holistic health. And I believe that my expertise, as well as that of my community, will guide me towards creating impactful entry points for mental health. Throughout the incubator, I focus primarily on three different segments, Black folks, artists, and mental health practitioners. It was through the mental health service providers that I learned about the difference between consuming art, like watching TV and film, or embodying art, like doing theater or playing instruments which prompted me to pivot from TV and film to the performing literary and vision, visual arts. So for me, my next steps, I plan to continue interviewing folks and expanding my knowledge of the field. Then I will develop and test programming. 
I've been lucky enough to secure a partnership with the Washington Improv Theater to test a pilot program. Then I will expand programming and seek additional arts partners. So for you all, my ask is that I would really welcome your support by introducing me to mental health practitioners so that I can continue to validate my hypotheses. I would also be grateful for introductions to art organizations, universities, community colleges, and continuing educational programs. Finally, please feel free to reach out and give me any feedback. I'm open to all sorts of discussions as well as ideas. Thank you so much for your time today. I am Lauren Jordan, and this is Community Experiments. Thank you so much, Community Experiments, for your pitch. I've always found that the arts have had such a profound impact on mental health. Um, I've actually once attended a glass blowing workshop um, that was meant to be a healing workshop for gun violence victims. Um, and it was actually one of the most impactful, um, best experiences I've ever had in my life. And I'm so excited to see where your venture goes. And next up, we have Cup of Gorilla, and you may begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are Team Capo Gorilla, and we are thrilled to have been able to participate in the Georgetown Summer Launch Incubator. Um, my name is uh, Yannick Munura, and although I am not affiliated with Georgetown University, uh, I am thankful for this opportunity. Um, my other teammates are uh, Jose and Sybil. Uh, Jose is uh, an MSF candidate at Georgetown right now, and Sibo is a recent MBA graduate from Georgetown as well. Um, I met Jose and Sibo in college and we've been friends ever since. And along the way, we decided to start a company to help uh, expand my family business to the US market. Um, my family has been in the coffee business for 18 years or so, and we grow and process our coffee here in Rwanda. And we produce fully washed, ACA approved specialty coffee. And uh, our coffee is also organic, uh, certified in Europe, Japan, and the US. Um, our company is dedicated to practicing social entrepreneurship uh, by helping uh, Rwandan farmers with uh, things like providing health care insurance, uh, building classrooms, providing clean water and uh, preserving uh, gorilla wildlife in Rwanda. Um, I would like to welcome Jose to dive deeper into our analysis. Thank you, Yannick. Team Cup of Gorilla's main objective was identifying a go-to market strategy to expand Yannick's family coffee business in the US. We set out the action items we needed to complete in order to determine the different routes we can take and the challenges that will come with each route. The actions we took to determine the product market fit are the following. We conducted about 100 surveys to date, engaged in about 30 one-on-one -on -one customer interviews with coffee enthusiasts or drinkers in our, in our network, and created financial models with assumptions to analyze each strategy. From here, we hypothesized two potential customer segments for a go-to market strategy for the family business. The first is a B2B commercial, and the second is a B2C specialty, which I will go over in more detail. For the B2B customer profile, in this market, the, this customer will have the demand for a supply of beans. Hence, forming a supply chain partnership will allow our B2B buyer to process the beans on their end, which then allows us to cut our costs on roasting, grinding the beans on our own. There's also a branding issue in this case, some, um, however, there is a branding issue, so a co-partnership co would, be, would be valuable um, in, this, um, in this customer profile. The second one is a B2C customer profile. In this profile, we have gathered that there's huge interest from US, customer, from US coffee drinkers to, to try more exotic, boutique, independently supplied specialty coffee beans. There's significant appeal for more sustainable sourcing and farming of coffee beans. People are interested to learn more of an extensive backstory of the origin of the beans and the social impact of the beans and how it benefits the local community and farmers. However, there is a branding issue since there is a lack of awareness of Rwanda being a player in the coffee industry, even from the average coffee enthusiast. 
Lastly, the coffee enthusiasts we interviewed have no demand for unroasted coffee, but do have a, but do have a demand for ungrounded coffee. After laying out the two scenarios, our team chose to pick the B2C customer segment as our go-to market strategy. This segment will be more scalable from a supply chain standpoint, as opposed to the B2B segment that will require commercial levels of volume. Even with roasting costs included, this case produces more reasonable production and logistical costs. It would require heavy investment in marketing and advertising, given the branding issue mentioned early, earlier of Rwanda lacking behind in its competitors in the coffee industry, especially from Africa. Our next steps would be for the B2C go-to market strategy are twofold, profitability and operational. From the profitability standpoint, we need to further quantify the needed marketing and advertising costs to elevate our Rwandan brand of coffee. Partnerships with vendors could be explored for cost minimization. For operational, we need to formulate an efficient supply chain plan of sending out packages when orders are received, maintain our online platform, and formulate other creative marketing and branding campaign ideas. Finally, our valuable learnings from the summer launch incubator are the following. Customer feedback was necessary to identify a certain customer profile we can target for a boutique specialty coffee. Financial models and assumptions in coming up with um, reasonable hypotheses were helpful in formulating a proper strategy to solve the problem. Lastly, the knowledge of our mentors and the presence of our own personal professional networks were vital in our team's progress. Special shout out to Neil Prem Kumar, Jill, Jill Monk, and Jaime Vasquez. Our only ask is we would love to stay in touch. We'd love to send out as many samples as possible to get our product out there. If anyone watching is interested to, sam to sample our coffee, please reach out to us below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coffee Gorilla. Um, having worked at coffee shops since I was 17 years old, I actually can't start my day without a cup of coffee. So I would definitely email you as I wanna be one of your first taste testers. <laughs> Next, we have Dagon, take it away. Hi, my name is Elliot from Dagon, and I'm a rising senior in Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I'm half French, half American, but I grew up in Brussels and Istanbul. My co-founder, Yunus, who's currently in Copenhagen, is Danish Moroccan and grew up in Copenhagen, Casablanca, and Paris. So if that doesn't have your head spinning, because this is a part where I'm supposed to grab your attention, right? Then get this. The League of Legends World Championship in 2019 which as most of you know, is an online esports game, had higher viewership than the Super Bowl. Yet there's no amateur infrastructure that allows players to compete and rank in fixed teams. But that might not mean much to you. So let me tell you a little story about basketball instead. Right now for League of Legends, it's as if you could watch the NBA, but then you could only play pickup. And originally we thought this was the only and biggest problem, but we realized that it's even worse than that. Not only can you only play pickup, but it's not even efficient. And so to illustrate, I want you to picture a long day at work. You're tired, you feel no sense of accomplishment. So you're looking forward to play pickup with your friends that night and really go at it. So after work, you go to the pickup court and none of your friends are there. You lose 30 minutes texting everyone to convince them to join and finally they join, but as per usual, they're not trying hard in game they're not focusing and they keep taking these ridiculous shots that you know they're never gonna make, which is highly frustrating. So you decide to go on the other half of the court and join strangers, but it turns out they're very toxic. Everyone is trash talking, insulting you each time you take a risk your shot. And then at some point, one player just bursts out in anger and leaves the game, leaving your team hanging. You finish the game and you're disgusted. So you just decide to leave and go home. A version of this experience happens often to every single player we've interviewed. Now you may ask, if this is a common experience, well, why are people still playing the game? According to them, it is the single best game they have ever played and when played right, it produces satisfaction like no other. And this is why we care. We wanna be fostering a positive gaming experience for Eunice's brother, for our best friends from high school, for all avid gamers, for the over 115 million players out there that recognize the superior quality of the game 
yet have a love-hate relationship with it because of the toxic community and the lack of amateur structure. So what exactly did we do to realize what we just shared? We conducted over 20 customer interviews in seven different countries with consistent findings that validated our central ideas and highlighted other major problems that we had minimized. As you suspected, prefer, people prefer playing with a fixed team, but struggle to do so, and want a more competitive environment. But surprisingly, toxicity was mentioned in every single customer interview and is a huge problem, along with coordination failure. Our customer interviews also led us to redefine our customer segments. Originally, we thought our customers, customers either had a team, and so they were a pack wolf, or they didn't have a team, and so they were a lone wolf but we realized that there are two main reasons to play and two preferences about who to play with, which gave us the social wolf who plays for entertainment and with friends and the competitive wolf who wants to play more competitively and with people at their level. And these are our hair on fire customers. So we came up with the key solutions that our venture would have to offer for these competitive wolves. Therefore, team creation, a positivity score, Think Uber rating, but for toxicity to help foster a positive gaming environment, a coordination tool to find the best times that fit our player's schedule, and structure with team rankings and weekly cash prize tournaments. So we decided to create an afternoon long event for these competitive wolves to test our assumptions. This event will be a cash prize tournament with a $5 sign up fee from which we will eventually take a 30% cut to generate revenue. We already have multiple signups and are currently doing more solution interviews. The next step is to do bigger scale testing with an online signup page and then use all of that feedback to move into building our MVP on Discord. Currently, we're looking for advisors who believe in our mission to fight toxicity and provide an enhanced gaming experience to amateur League of Legends players in order to help increase our venture's credibility and keep us on track for success. Furthermore, any connection to the esports industry would be highly appreciated. Thank you for your time and I hope you'll connect. Thank you so much, Dagon, for your pitch. A few years ago, I actually tore my ACL, so I've been trying to pick up some other hobbies, including video games, considering it's not as easy to go to a pickup game anymore. Um, and I've definitely resonated with a lot of the different things that you mentioned, including toxicity and finding teams. So I'm excited to give this a try um, and, and use this as one of my hobbies during this um, pandemic. All right, next up, we have dopamine. Please start whenever you're ready. To give a little bit of background on myself, I immigrated away from my extended family when I was six, but my grandfather would always call and ask when I'll be coming home. After 15 years, He's forgotten why he's asking the same question. It wasn't until I started studying biology that I realized he has Alzheimer's. Now, as a biology major, I discovered that the diagnoses of neurological diseases and disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, and ADHD only occur after significant symptomatic progression because of imbalances in dopamine levels, which leaves millions of people undiagnosed with debilitating neurological diseases. My name is Tian Chi, and I am a senior at Georgetown University studying biology, cognitive science, and entrepreneurship. As a founder of Dopamine, I'm developing a dopamine sensor that can detect and monitor your internal dopamine levels. So let's back up. What is dopamine? It is a neurotransmitter in our brain that controls our mood, mental health, and is one of the key biomarkers of long-term neurodegenerative diseases. If we keep our dopamine levels within the normal range, we have a chance to prolong or even mitigate the onset of neurodegenerative diseases that affect one in six million people worldwide. I want to provide a dopamine monitor that allows for early diagnosis for imbalances in internal dopamine levels. Dopamine's non-invasive patch design allows users to see whether their neurotransmitter levels are above, below, or within the normal range through visual cues. To this end, I discovered three customer segments. First, individuals predisposed to neurodegenerative diseases have a strong interest in learning about their mental health to mitigate the chance and onset of neurological diseases. In speaking to 20 of these individuals, 
I discovered that there is a lack of centralized resources and support systems in the diagnostic process. Secondly, nursing homes predominantly handle patients with undiagnosed diseases, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, and schizophrenia. Through interviewing five nursing homes, there was a direct need for additional caregivers and funding, causing them to heavily rely on insurance companies for support. And finally, collegiate and professional athletes want to enhance their athletic performance by better understanding their physical body and their mental health. This was reaffirmed by 25 interviews with collegiate athletes. Through these conversations, it became clear dopamine's most sustainable and main customer segment are individuals predisposed to neurodegenerative diseases because of their dire and inherent need for dopamine's diagnostic technology. However, penetrating this customer segment will be difficult given the necessary FDA approval and clinical studies. Therefore, a more attainable customer segment in the short term is collegiate and professional athletes. Sports is as much a mental game as a physical one, and through better understanding their mental and physical health, athletes can enhance their performance. I will enter this market through Georgetown's D1 athletic program. However, in order to expand, dopamine needs widespread recognition before it is implemented in collegiate athlete athletic programs, most of which have tight budgeting. Consequently, I need to onboard more professional athletes to generate traction within the sporting industry. Dopamine's offering to our customers is a dopamine sensor. Before SLI, this was our only offering. But after over 50 customer interviews, I discovered this wasn't enough. We can't tell people that there's a problem without providing a solution. For those whose neurotransmitter levels fall outside of the normal range, they would have access to therapists, support groups, dedicated caregivers, diet plans, and educational resources. These auxiliary services will be available on a subscription basis. I am planning to have product market fit validation for my main customer segments within six months. With that, I can apply to NIH grants to secure funding to produce a working MVP within 18 months. I will then be able to beta test dopamine sensor technology with athletes, allowing me to penetrate the popular market. To further validate this hypothesis, I need to get in contact with professional athletes. Additionally, I'd love to talk to insurance companies to see if dopamine sensor technology can be incorporated into the annual checkup. I am asking for possible introductions to professional athletes or friends working at insurance companies. If you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, please feel free to email me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, dopamine, for your pitch. Uh, I believe that a person's health is absolutely invaluable to their livelihood. Right? And it's something that we may not be able to nurture and cultivate as often as we would like to. And I think this product could really help athletes and a lot of other people live happier and help, happy, uh, happier and healthier lives. And next up, um, I want, we're going to hear from Dream LLC. Take it away, Dream. Awesome. Hello. All right, give us one second. Awesome, hi, I'm Victor and I'm the founder of Dream and I'm accompanied by two of my amazing teammates. First, I have Ace and Grace with us. At the beginning of the pandemic, I really struggled with my mental health. As a PTSD survivor, my experience of anxiety, loneliness and depression hiked up. Thankfully, I had a lot of tools like recovery meetings, exercise, nutrition and therapy. And I started making social media content to help others. At Dream, we support trauma and mental health survivors with social media content and merchandise via our Dream Shop store to support them on navigating their relationship with themselves and others with the main goal of helping them live the life of their dreams. Why we care. The support we offer is by us, for us, with the main intention of helping others not struggle like we did. We enjoy doing this work to help others do their work what we thought the problem was. At the beginning of January, we did an initial customer discovery process where we interviewed and we developed an initial hypothesis. And that was that trauma survivors need additional resources outside of therapy to support them on their healing and personal growth journey. And this is the hypothesis that we tested this summer. Now, Ace. 
what we've done so far. So during our time here, we've done a variety of different things to test our hypothesis. We started by conducting 25 initial interviews to see what our problem, what the problem was that customers needed help with and to see if we could help them. We then began to do different types of content experimentation on various different platforms with various different content, doing videos on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. After seeing what content resonated with our audiences, we began to increase our output to one video a day to see if we could grow our business to see if what we had learned was applying. We saw that those results were amazing. We were able to double our following from 300 to almost 700 followers on TikTok and were able to get over 20,000 views all in the span of just one month. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Grace. What we learned. Firstly, we learned key insights from our interviews that helped us refine and expand our content focus. Many of the interviewees cited that they struggle with anxiety, addiction, depression, and loneliness, which validated our assumptions. However, many also talked about their struggles with self-worth, body image, and eating disorders. Relationship struggles were also a common theme, with topics such as setting better boundaries and managing abusive relationships. Many of the tools people use include journaling, body work, podcasts, books, and social media. Secondly, we altered our branding to center more on relationships with self and others. For relationships with self, we will help people to address their traumas, work on their mental health, and realize their self-worth. For relationships with others, we will offer tools for romantic family and friend relationships. And thirdly, we also realized we had to do work to narrow our target segments. We went from any trauma or mental health survivor to three main segments and two sub-segments. With all of the segments interested in personal growth, self-love, improving relationships, and healing their mental health. Our dating advice videos would be more geared towards the single men and women segments, and content on queer identity and trauma would be applicable to the queer people. Next, Victor. Next steps. The first one is to grow our community on various platforms, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We have a strategy for each platform that we're constantly refining. And thankfully, with the nature of social media, we get constant feedback every day. The second step is focus content. So we interviewed 25 people and they shared the mental health, relationship struggles and tools that they currently use. And so for example, they didn't mention bipolar disorder. So we won't make content on bipolar disorder. The third one is finalizing and launching our store. Dream Shop, here are two of our designs, Strong and Beautiful and I Am Worthy. We have, we have a design intern and we worked on 20 designs and it's launching in July and we plan on promoting via micro-influencers. Our ask, follow us, screenshot at Victor Dream on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube for more content on mental health, relationship advice, and self-love, and to also receive updates on our store. And Ace will also post, and you'll have all the links to follow us, and here's my email be below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dream LLC, for your pitch. Uh, mental health now is certainly more important than ever, especially as we're all cooped up in the house um, and unable to really enjoy a lot of the activities that we're used to. Um, and so we had to make with the resources that we have, especially by connecting with people and platforms on social media uh, to see how we can live holistically our best lives. Um, mental, and I'm really excited to give you all a follow. And next up, we have EMT tomorrow. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Jalen Menton and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of EMT Tomorrow. I'm joined by my co-founder and CEO, Nina Williams, and Grant Director, Chris Grisham. Together, we founded the nonprofit EMT Tomorrow in June of 2020, with a mission to create an accessible emergency medical service education pathway for underserved young adults in DC. We do this by providing a free EMT training course that offers individualized support to our students. During our freshman year at Georgetown, we all took the Georgetown EMT training class together where we actually first met. We are so grateful that we had the opportunity to take this class, obtain our license, and now work as EMTs for the Georgetown EMS service. However, we realized that there were significant barriers for community members to take this course that we gained so much from. The course is inaccessible by public transportation and costs nearly triple for community members as what it does for students. Taking a step back, 
we saw that these barriers are not confined to the gates of our university. In DC and nationwide, there is systemic inaccessibility in EMT training. Did you know that EMTs are the only first responders that must pay for their training when seeking a paid position? In DC, courses cost between $2,000 and $5,000, a sum that not all residents can afford. This has contributed to the low racial and ethnic diversity in the EMS workforce nationally, with only 7% of EMS professionals identifying as Black and 9% identifying as Hispanic. In DC, there also exists a gap in course offerings such that courses are centralized in affluent wards, leaving underserved wards without geographically accessible options. In this past year, we've built an amazing team to help make this dream into a reality. We have been able to capitalize on the expertise of our board of directors who hold positions such as the assistant fire chief of EMS operations for the district, the work, uh, youth workforce coordinator of Lifespan Hospital, and the corporate relations officer with the DC Department of Parks and Recreation. With our wonderful medical director and a range of partners, it has been all hands on deck to establish our first pilot course. During this incubator, we focused our attention on potential funders and new and existing partnerships. We conducted interviews with two local EMS agencies to test our value proposition of ensuring immediate job placement for all participants that complete the EMT Tomorrow course. Through this, we identified two new EMS agencies that are short-staffed and seeking an easier pathway for recruitment and are therefore interested in partnering with EMT Tomorrow. We also interviewed four philanthropic foundations to identify best practices for our grant application. They explain that effectively portraying vision and potential impact are key for startup nonprofits to have su successful applications. Additionally, since securing sustainable revenue sources is a huge priority for our organization, we explored and reevaluated relationships with our partners. We discovered some logistical challenges with one of our onboarding government partners. However, in line with the mission of the Summer Launch Incubator, we use those challenges as an opportunity to pivot our current approach to funding sources, and we have now realized the potential for additional financial support from one of our corporate partners. At this stage of our course development, we really wanted to explore specific components of our course design and curriculum that we had not previously validated with certain customer segments and competitors. We interviewed EMTs from six different training centers regarding their perspectives on accessibility and diversity in their training. We also reached out to four established training centers to ask about what education they provide relating to equity in healthcare delivery and caring for diverse populations. We confirmed with both current EMTs and training centers that there is not explicit diversity training covered in the standard EMS curriculum. Current EMTs also stressed the need for coverage on LGBTQ and socioeconomic topics specifically. These new perspectives about the status quo allowed us to validate the need for diversity training in our course. Additionally, the EMTs validated the accessibility measures of our program, which currently include food, transportation, location, certification and licensing fees, and other hidden costs. Now, we ask that you join in on our mission to create this opportunity for economic mobility for the young adults at DC. We hope to launch our class this winter, training 45 students in the first year. For you in the audience, I ask that anyone who is connected with funders that might be interested in the program, or if you're connected with like-minded ventures that can mutually support or mentor our program, we'd be extremely grateful to connect. Also on that note, we've been looking for pro bono legal services. So if anyone has information on where to find those, that would also be greatly appreciated. Feel free to visit our website or email us to learn more at emttomorrow.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, EMT Tomorrow. To cultivate a better future, it's absolutely critical to ensure that everyone has fair access to career opportunities, training, um, workforce, um, workshops. And our first responders are incredible and in getting more people from a variety of backgrounds and all involved in this good work is necessary. And up next, we have Go Cook. Please begin whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, I will never forget the summer after freshman year. My first year at college, I was so ca caught up with the newness of everything that I did not realize how unhealthy my eating habits had gotten. During the break, I felt so uncomfortable with myself that I started purposely avoiding plans. Even my mom proceeded to say how she thought I was secretly pregnant, 
just so you understand the gravity of the situation. Going into sophomore year, I was determined to achieve a balanced diet and improve my overall well-being. Yet, trying to maintain the high cost of a healthy lifestyle, ingredients, and food delivery services at my current budget was impossible. The cheapest option was to stay on the college meal plan. But as you can see from this word map, according to college students we interviewed, dining halls are not ideal. Throughout college, I kept trying to, to find a way to eat healthy on a budget and have a di uh, balanced diet. Yet, um, spoiler alert, I never figured it out. With my two co-founders, Drew Jory and Maria Alcure, we are determined to find a way and a solution for these college students who struggle, like Maria, Drew, and I, to find a balance. On October 2020, we started putting together an app to help college students find recipes, meal plan, keep track of their current ingredients, and more. We were focusing on six different hypotheses at once and trying to build a complex app as an MVP which as we learned throughout our time in the incubator is not an ideal approach nor a true MVP in itself. During these past weeks, we have conducted 30 customer interviews to college students around the US, which have allowed us to reevaluate our problem and to create a new hypothesis. Now, our survey results showed us some trends in the criteria students use when they buy their products. The first thing students focus on when they're grocery shopping is price. And afterwards, they focus on buying convenient products that do not require a lot of time or preparation. We were also surprised by the amount of students who actually have a focus on health. They care about the origin and the nutritional value of their products, whether, for example, these are organic, non-GMO, low in sugar, etc. However, our main takeaway from these customer interviews is that students are stuck in this repetitive pattern where they buy the same groceries and repeat the same five simple recipes. This is what really grabbed our attention. We want to know why do students stay in this cooking safe zone. So we narrowed our target audience to not only college students, but college students who do not use the meal plan, who are already cooking, and we developed our new hypothesis, which is that college students who cook consider time and inspiration to be their biggest problem. Now, our main purpose right now is to validate this hypothesis, and we're going to do this through new customer interviews that focus on discovering the main challenges of cooking for college students. Our greatest takeaway from the Summer Launch Incubator is the fact that we've effectively managed to switch from a just-do-it startup approach to the more efficient lean startup met methodology. And in order to do so, our single focus goal is to gain traction for our application. And so in the immediate aftermath of this incubator, we plan to spend July uh, putting together our data set by building out, by testing out our new hypothesis among interview subjects. And our aim is to validate every development decision we do with the data we collect from these interviews. We therefore aim to use the months of July and August to continue our deep dive into the marketplace and then use that information to build a simple and efficient product to be released at, at or to be released at Georgetown during the fall semester. Now, how we get there? Um, the first step of how we get of getting there is funding. We plan to bootstrap until we get to a point of traction. Uh, we recognize that the moment we get traction is when we can begin going into a seed round or any other financial mechanism. One of the major advantages that we've got is we've got a, an effective mechanism of outsourced technology set up. We currently have a team of over 15 people based in India working to put together our MVP for a fraction of the cost that it would take in any other, in particularly in the US, which our competitors are facing. And so we're constantly looking at a variety of food tech trends to find a way to create cheaper, more simple options for college students. Uh, the third step that we're taking is partnerships. We're constantly, as I said, we're constantly looking at food trends and partnerships. And one of the major developments we had through the incubator was we managed to get an introduction to the Georgetown meal plan service, who after a super positive uh, series of super positive meetings are interested in folding in our app as an integration offered to for free to all college students on a meal plan. So when call when as guardrails for when college students get off a meal plan. Um, so uh, in terms of what we're interested in getting help on, we would love any potential into potential introductions to individuals in the food tech space. We're constantly looking for new opportunities to integrate and collaborate with people in the space. 
Thank you for listening to us. And if you have any feedback, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for your pitch, Go Cook. During your pitch, I definitely felt guilty because I'm one of those college students who also find or lack time and inspiration to be able to cook healthy meals. Um, in DC, usually my go-to is just to get takeout from my favorite Ethiopian restaurant, which is Carrie and Admo. But until then, I would definitely check out Go Cook um, as a solution, as, uh, as being one of those people in the customer segment who also lack time and inspiration. Next up, we have Libero. Go for it. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Pandey and I'm a recent MBA graduate from the Georgetown McDonough School of Business. My team and I are gonna to pitch to you today our financial technology app called Libero, which is aiming to help non-traditional communities gain access to brokerage mar markets. Right now in the status quo, there's a lot of Americans who have been overlooked and neglected by the banking industry. What that means is that over 50 million Americans don't have a strong credit score, which bars them from buying a house or buying any critical product. Roughly 16% of Americans today are in need of some type of financial mentorship. And what that means is that they have a checking and savings account, but they don't know how to exactly take advantage of growth capital markets. Furthermore, 148 million Americans aren't even using a brokerage service regardless. And this is due to a lot of the banking industry not targeting a lot of Americans who truly need that help and that support. Our team aims to change that. The problem that we condensed over doing 50 in-person interviews, or not in-person, Zoom interviews, was that there are three key problems. One, there's a lack of access due to lack of financial industry and illiteracy, not being top of mind and not having enough liquidity. Two, there's no specific goal setting. When you drop money into, let's say, a stash account or a ETF or even a CD, you just leave it there. It turns into a black hole. So in the end, what actually helps people come and reach their goal? specific goal setting. And we found that there's no specific goal setting that, that's tied to any type of financial apps in the market today. And lastly, user retention. A lot of brokerages have a tough time keeping people engaged because there's no specific insights that are pushed to that user that help to show them that they're achieving their goal. So our solution today is simply a software platform that integrates with your bank and brokerage to provide three key benefits. One, very specific, specific goal planning. This means if you want to save 20% down for a house, you want to save for a car, or you want to save for an appliance, let's talk Peloton, we can track that and report on your progress through your brokerage account. So instead of just dropping your money in a black hole, you'll see where you're going. Two, a user-specific interface and design that actually shows you metrics towards getting to that goal. And lastly, goal-based incentives. This means that we're actually going to waive banking fees on mortgages, utilize tax loss harvesting so you don't get tax on capital gains, and also provide you specific product discounts. So our user profile is individuals between the ages of 18 to 32. These are individuals who are not using a brokerage. They might be using a brokerage right now, but they just have no financial direction or mentorship to help them reach a goal. And lastly, they're incentivized by a specific deal or unique offer. When you look at the market compared to us, there's been a lot of hype around Robinhood, which again is super risky. And a lot of folks within that age range don't really use it despite all the hype. Betterment, Stash, Wealthfront, and Acorns also are just black holes. Sure, they help you mature and get a higher yield to maturity, but in the end, they are just a black hole for your money that don't actually help you be accurate with what your goal is. That's the same thing with Marcus and SoFi. They're huge, huge financial technology companies, but they have a huge white space in terms of helping people get up past that level of wealth generation. Our application is very focused, it's trackable, it's incentive-based, and it's long-term. In the end, it helps people learn more about the brokerage industry and reach their goal. And when I talk about goal, what I mean is that our first pilot is gonna be focused on helping individuals save 20% down. Whenever you think of a brokerage account and putting money away that actually gains interest, we're gonna help you target it so you can get to 20% down. And then we're gonna roll you over with the same bank into a mortgage plan. You just need to provide us what the square footage is, where's the location, and what house you're looking at, along with some of your financial information of how much you want to deposit into that bank account. In exchange, we're going to also see if we can help you improve your credit score, as well as waive all fees and reduce maybe APR on your mortgage plan. Our revenue model is very simple. We're going to be charging banks a $500 set of fee. That's it. That's very appealing for banks to par partner with us, and more or less, it helps us scale at a stronger rate. 
Our team is all MBAs. These are all my classmates. And these are the people that all have a diversity of thought. They helped me get through my MBA journey and they all are just amazing people. And us together saw this problem in the financial industry and we wanna fix it. So our short-term plan is to at least conduct 50 interviews over um, Zoom, refine our MVP, talk to a lot of the mentors in the incubator and focus more on collecting bank data. In July, we're gonna be interviewing community banks which are plugged into these communities that so need this service. And then we're gonna move forward in the next four to five months which launching a bank pilot to help us increase our user growth. Next, we'll be looking for non-dilutive capital to help build a prototype and integrate. So in the end, our ask to you, all of everyone watching this is just three main things. One, if you have anyone in banks focused on wealth management, loan departments, or anyone who has financial resources or networks focused on disadvantaged communities, or lastly, you have maybe some insights or specific advice, we would really appreciate, appreciate it hearing from you. So in the end, we are Libera, and we hope to help more people use brokerages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Libera, for your pitch. I'm glad that Libero can come to my rescue because as someone who's 21 years old, I'm just starting to think about retirement, um, potentially buying a home, investing, and I have absolutely no idea on where to start. Um, so I definitely will use Libero as a compass for my financial projections and management. And next up, we have Speak Easy. Please take the floor. Hey guys, we are Speak Easy, and we are excited to walk you through our journey with the SLI. Whether it's a friend, a family member, or maybe even yourself, struggles with mental or sexual health are far too common in our community. A simple Google search highlights the huge gaps in education and resources for the taboo topics of mental and sexual health, which we define as not only sexual education, but also resources for sexual identity and orientation explorations. This creates unnecessary hardships in these important developmental and transitional stages of young adults' lives, as their bodies and minds are growing in new and sometimes scary ways. Our team bonded while sharing experiences of ourselves and loved ones' struggles with the stigmatized topics of mental and sexual health. This all leads to a disconcerted synergy that has made it evident that these spaces need to be addressed and talked about. The COVID-19 pandemic and quarantine has brought these challenges to the forefront. My name is Malika and with my co-founders, Binya, Molly and Jay of the Masters in Biotechnology program, we came up with the idea of Speakeasy, which has evolved greatly over the past few weeks with the help, help of our mentors and their guidance and super helpful feedback. We envisioned a comprehensive social media app providing users with real-time, up-to-date, professionally curated content on mental and sexual health topics, including messaging and community sharing feeds, as well as a large user referral database, providing actionable next steps to users, such as connections to care providers, domain experts, and even personal trainers or fitness instructors. It was a very big goal, and we used the time in this program to narrow down the idea at the suggestion of our mentors. Entering the SLI, we step back to better understand the present landscape of challenges and resources. Firstly, we narrowed down our scope to just focus on mental health for the time being. We interviewed our end users, college students, as well as key opinion leaders such as therapists, academic advisors, and volunteers. In addition to seeking anecdotes and personal experiences, we asked for feedback on various aspects of our app idea to identify and hone in on the greatest opportunity. These interviews unveiled key trends and opportunities. A resounding number of end users from immigrant and minority communities described how mental health is taboo or even non-existent in their upbringing. Many students navigate the transition through peer support and mentorship. However, first-generation immigrants voiced a lack of personal connections with similar experiences. We view this as a demonstrated need for a platform creating and fostering these relationships with like-minded individuals and interviewees demonstrated an interest in participating in both mentor and mentee roles. Speaking as a daughter of immigrants, finding someone who can fully relate to you, your struggles and your background can be a grueling and difficult process. This subject of full relatability came up in all but one of our interviews with minorities. Customer interviews unveiled a particular interest and the therapist matchmaking and mentorship community arms of our original idea. 
particularly enjoying the anonymity and wide reach of a mobile app, indicating an exciting avenue, a speakeasy's point of entry. We have honed in on growing the community and creating peer relationships for minority populations. Moving forward, we will con continue engaging with customers to better understand customer segments and motivations, ultimately op optimizing this platform for widespread adoption and, and impact. We hope to specifically look at different cultural and social minorities in order to investigate what is most needed and valued in each specific community to continue segmenting our customer base and optimize our product. As we optimize our product, we will engage and recruit users and partners to Speakeasy. Thank you for listening to us today. If the Speakeasy vis vision, mission, and product is of interest to you, please email us or go to our landing page. Or if you have experiences in this space and would like to share some insight, we would love to connect and hear from you. Thank you so much, Speakeasy, for your pitch. I resonate with your mission statement a lot, especially since I'm a first-generation college student um, and my parents immigrated here from Vietnam. So certainly in my upbringing, upbringing mental health wasn't something we talked about it's because it's a taboo subject. So I'm excited to see how Speakeasy can help my communities and many other immigrant communities just like it. And next up, we have the Catch to It project. Please enjoy. Please. In 2018, I went to the market in Bolivia and suddenly was a stranger in my own homeland. My grandmother, the one who used to speak our native language with the vendors had died and social stigma had left me with the supposed privilege of not speaking it. Language is a powerful factor in identity, but all Native American languages are endangered due to centuries of erasure. The Quechua Project champions Quechua language in my community, the Bolivian diaspora of Metro DC, roughly 300,000 people strong. We focus on Gen Zs and millennials. Our revolutionary business model uses social influence for language revitalization and our nonprofit and for-profit work supports indigenous rights as defined by the UN. Experts say that social transmission is the key to our language survival. So we've recreated a safe social media space where our youth can use their Quechua and gain nearly 1,100 followers in just nine months. And now we wanna amplify Quechua language and knowledge and support our work by sharing with the world our traditional alcoholic drinks that we currently produce for personal consumption, chicha and huarapo. Our founders have management consulting, Quechua language and visual arts backgrounds. And I, Shana Ino Fuentes, just earned my master's in communication, culture, and technology from Georgetown in May. We're four daughters of the community and our proximity to it is our greatest asset. Chicha is an ancient drink made of fermented native foods such as corn, quinoa, strawberry, and peanut. And what apples made of grape. They're drenched in environmentally conscious customs, served in earthen jars, decorated with symbols of her bounty, we drink them out of reusable gourds and always pour a bit back to her first to thank her. They're gluten-free, plant-based, ours would be organic, and they're usually brewed by women. SLI was an amazing opportunity for us. They led us through customer interviews and evidence collection. We needed to understand what's the product market fit beyond our community? What synergies exist between user need and the social awareness that we produce. We found that Gen Zs of marginalized communities, especially black and indigenous immigrants who grew up in the US want to feel seen and valued. And they want to buy from businesses that do those things but, buy, but find few or no such options when buying alcohol. Others in the same age range are just looking for ways to help. And we found that validating because we, we found that our products seem to resonate with minority youth of other communities beyond ours. And through our products, we create ways for anyone to be true partners in our indigenous rights work. We also found that we shouldn't try to compete in the existing beer and cider markets or try to fit in, that is. We're just not them. Instead, we should try to forge the unique space that Quechua, that uh, Chicha and Huarapo deserve. 
We also found that we should consider non-alcoholic versions of our fermenteds, and we found a large federal grant for which we'll apply. Next, we'll interview millennials of the same demographic, and we need to figure out how to incorporate our jars, gourds, and Quechua language into our products to fuel social impact. And we also need to figure out shelf stability. Chicha is very delicate, but a leading beverage company in Bolivia just started selling it in bottles. We'll also experiment. Everyone we've asked so far is very excited to be a beta tester. And we're considering hosting a contest and fair of chicha, warapu, and Bolivian foods. We envision going to market B2B as a top shelf drink at vegan friendly and farm, vegan friendly bars and farm to table locales. And to plant word of mouth seeds via B2C at farmers markets and via our organic social media activism. What we need to succeed is people power. We need grant support, fundraising expertise, and we'd love to meet any partners, potential partners or guides for the Chicha contest. The Quechua project believes that a more just world is possible and that together, Cusca, we can do it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, the Quechua project for your pitch. Um, for me, when I was younger, one of my dream jobs was actually to be a test taster. And I so long has, haven't really grappled with that idea yet and haven't pursued it. Um, because I found out that a lot of the things that people taste test aren't actually things that they like. However, I may have to revert back to that career um, just to try your chicha. And next up is Wadbank. Please take the floor whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ishmael Mehmed, and today I'm going to present to you Wad Bank, a modern interest-free halal banking platform. And as a founder, I'm currently pursuing my master's in real estate with concentration in global investments and development. I have five years of experience in investments, finance, and more specifically, Islamic financial products. I started this venture because of my own personal struggles. As a practicing Muslim, it's nearly impossible to find any fit any faith-based banking services since everything is tied to usury, something prohibited in Islam. Simple things such as going to school without incurring any debt, being able to purchase a car without taking on an expensive lease or waiting to save for something some subpar or finding limited mortgage products is a challenge. And so you might be asking, what is halal banking then? Halal banking is an alternative form of financing that allows Islamic guidelines, including the prohibition of charging or earning interest and focuses on equity by sharing the risk between the lender and the borrower. The best part, you can be from any faith background to use halal banking. The problems. With halal banking in mind, what were our hypotheses? Prior to the summer launch incubator, we found two problems. The first problem being that I wasn't alone. Over 250 million Muslims are underbanked and do not have access to faith-based banking services across North America, the Middle East, Europe, and North African regions. The other problem is that banks have gone away with unethical and non-transparent practices leading to systemic economic problems, such as late fees, hidden fees, ballooning debt traps, and unsustainable wealth gaps, which lead us to our why. We believe that, we believe that better Banking can be better, and that halal banking offers an ethical alternative that's based on transparency, ethics, and people to solve modern day economic problems. And we understand our core demographics more than anyone else. So for our progress, over the last four weeks during the program, we achieved over 750 signups for our waiting list, a 28% increase. We've also doubled our social media following to over 300 plus followers, and we conducted over 20 plus interviews outlining which products to launch and to where. We also secured our first partnership with an independent dealer to test auto lending products over the next couple of months. And within the last 24 hours, we have raised over $1,000 to launch a special purpose vehicle to fund micro farms and micro loans to the working class in Bangladesh and other developing markets. And what have we learned? We learned to always listen to our customers. Our customers give us the keys to find what they want 
how they want it, allowing us to grow faster. We also learned that making connections is important, whether it be mentors, potential customers, or even people we've interviewed who said no, they all played a crucial role to our growth. And of course, always pivot strategically. By doing so, we're able to reduce startup costs and timelines while also regaining our focus. But that's not all. We also learned that over 60% of our scientists were Muslim people from the background, but also 40% were from other diverse backgrounds. We learned that people don't want hidden fees, no interest, and overall, any funny business. And because of our time in the summer launch program, we validated that people want halal banking to be the norm. And this is what our future kind of looks like. We want to reach 1K signups by this weekend, launch our beta platform for the first quarter of next year, and do a full launch of our platform by the fourth quarter of 2022. But to achieve this, we need a former digital bank employee to guide us along the way, a banking partner to test our initial platform, and we need you to sign up and help us reach our 1K signup list by end of the, uh, this weekend. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop us a line or visit our website. And I appreciate your time and let's work together to make banking better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wadbank, for your pitch. This past year, I actually took a financial technology class. An entire um, segment of the course talked about unbanked populations and how difficult it is to get financial services. So I'm glad that Wadbank is trying to bridge this digital divide and ensure that underserved populations have the accesses they need um, and opportunities they need to make sure that they can access financial resources. Um, and next off, I'm going to pass it to Ben Zimmerman, the Managing Director of Georgia Entrepreneurship, to close out the show. Wow, thanks, Megan. And thanks to all you wonderful summer launchers. Uh, I know that's a, a long um, 12 pitches in a row, but uh, we made it through. And more importantly, it was four weeks of blood, sweat, and tears. And it's really bittersweet to be um, kind of bringing it to a close here. Um, I am not the last person to speak, though. I actually have a special guest, uh, a former summer launch incubator participant and MBA uh, alumna herself, uh, Ashley Berghoff. Um, she graduated a few years back, and since then, she's been pursuing her passion and her company titled A Squared. And all of it is in an effort to help entrepreneurs build the systems their businesses need to grow and experience more freedom in their businesses. And she has a few words of wisdom for you all, um, participants as well as audience members. And she's also going to award the Summer Launch Incubator Spirit Prize uh, for the cohort voted team that embodies the values, spirit, and the work ethic of a summer launch incubator extraordinary team. Anyhow, uh, enough about me talking here. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley. Thanks for being here. Uh, I believe Ashley's out in the mountains. Um, so welcome back virtually over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. And it's just such a privilege to be back here with all of you. I have the most incredible memories of being part of the summer launch incubator back in 2018. Um, I joined that program just a few months after I started A Squared at the end of 2017. And when I first started my business and when I first joined the program, my big expectation really was that the steepest learning curve would be around the strategies and tactics of entrepreneurship, business model planning and pricing and all of those things. And that learning curve was definitely real. And I was so grateful for all of the mentors and everyone who supported me in those technical ways. But something that I began to learn at that time and I've learned more and more ever since was that the most powerful part of entrepreneurship isn't that, it's how it changes us as people and who we become as entrepreneurs. And so I was really thrilled to hear that the Spirit Prize for the incubator this year is related to, to that, into the values and the mission and who you, know, who you all are as entrepreneurs and who you have been for one another because relationships and being on mission together is an indispensable part of this whole journey. And so I'm just thrilled to be here with you. It was such a gift to hear all of your pitches. You did an incredible job. And um, I just loved how all of you are seeking to make the world better. You're seeking good for the world through the work that you're doing. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the Spirit Prize is. 
Um, so I launched my group program uh, through A Squared back in December, really focused on helping entrepreneurs experience freedom in their businesses through systems and delegation. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs end up not able to unplug, thinking about their business all hours of the day and night, uh, feeling guilty about taking vacations and not thinking about their business for a few days, um, and can feel like they're drowning, right? And, and end up stuck in their growth because they don't have any more time to give. Um, and so my goal is to use systems and team building as a tool to make sustainable entrepreneurship possible, make it possible to enjoy your life in the midst of entrepreneurship. Because another thing I've discovered is that arrival doesn't exist. Um, you're always on the journey. You're always pressing forward to something new. And so um, we don't want to wait till some future moment to experience, you know, freedom and the ability to uh, have strong, thriving relationships and a strong quality of life in the midst of entrepreneurship. And so the, the winning team today will have the chance to join uh, for six months in that program on a full scholarship, um, which normally would cost over $3,000. And I'm just really excited to have some of you in that group to really um, connect with other entrepreneurs who are a few years further down the line, as most of our group members are, um, and get one-on-one -on -one support for me so we can build that stable foundation and help you grow these businesses strong. Um, so without further ado, I'm just so honored that I get to announce that winner. Um, so the winner of the 2021 Spirit, uh, Spirit Award for the Summer Launch Incubator is Go cook. Um, so Marie, Dhruv, and Caridad, congratulations. Um, I'm so excited to get to know you and support you however I can. Your cohort is cheering you on. And this was just an incredible event. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you all today, Ben. Um, I'll pass the mic back to you to close us out. Thanks. Actually, Jeff Reed, are you there? I am here. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Jeff, over to you. Bring awesome, Ashley. Thanks so much. So great to see you coming back as part of our community. Uh, it's so great to watch your business continue to thrive. So thanks for being here for that. Uh, thanks to Laura and Ben, our co-directors of this amazing program. Thank you to Megan for doing such a great job as our MC. Thanks to Neil for uh, supporting this, making it possible, and to Raul for uh, kicking us off with some inspiring comments there. Uh, most of all, thanks to the participants. You guys did a great job over the last few weeks and a great job today presenting your progress. We are here as Georgetown Entrepreneurship to continue helping. So even though today is the end of this program, it's not the end of your engagement. As you heard from Ashley, you know, we stay connected for a long time. Uh, and if, for, it, for those of you who are graduating, uh, you are now part of our alumni community. And, uh, and we have a lot of resources to help those of you who are alumni and launching businesses. Uh, and I'm excited because right now, today is the day we relaunched the Georgetown Venture Lab in a brand new location. And I am there, I am, I am at uh, 200 Mass Ave WeWork and I'm gonna give you guys a quick tour, just really fast, right? So say hello to Callie, our lab manager, and, uh, and just check out the view. There's space, space here for alumni entrepreneurs and uh, you can see the Georgetown Law Center and the Capitol building right over there. So with that, just wanna thank everybody for tuning in today and being a part of this program. Our next event is gonna be September 30th. We have the rocket pitch competition where you'll see another batch of aspiring student entrepreneurs making their pitches. So thanks again for making the 2021 Summer Launch Incubator an amazing success. Hope to see you again soon.